All right, everyone, welcome to Tech.MNCTO Spotlight. You may notice a little bit something different this time around. That's something different being uh, myself. I'm stepping in for Jack Stark, who usually co-hosts this series. My name is Alex Shung. I am the content manager for Tech.MN. But no matter all the changes on my end, we still have Old Faithful. Nels Pedersen of LiveFront here as the co-host as well. We are excited to welcome to the program for this edition, the CTO of a company that has had a lot of news this year. They have doubled their employee base, partnered with a fashion retailer, raised $55 million, eclipsed 1,000 Canadian retail partners, and recently announced a Save the Shopper holiday shopping campaign. We have Killian Brackey, CTO of Sezzle. Sezzle, I'm sorry, I'm gonna start that over, is that okay? Uh, no, you, you can go for it. We get, we get a lot of funny pronunciations, you know, people around the world pronounce it differently. <laughs> so we get sizzling, sizzle, uh, you know, autocorrect on a lot of phones comes in with sizzling and everything else. So yeah, all the time. Uh, well, the company has definitely been sizzling this year. Um, but we will start, let's start with you personally. Um, so let's, we like to open up the, the CTO series with a little bit of a deep dive into the person themselves, the history of their professional background and how they really uh, kind of clump, climbed the rungs of the CTO ladder to get to the position they are now. So if you could just walk us through kind of your professional background and, and what you brought you to Sezzle today. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, excited to be here uh, chatting with both of you today. Uh, you know, we've obviously had an exciting uh, history at Sezzle. And for me, I, I started my uh, kind of technical career. I, I actually put this back into like, my middle school days. I've been writing code and tinkering with things and taking on um, little projects, whether it be programming calculators, building websites through high school, you know, trying to understand kind of the security implications of some of the kind of embedded systems development and understanding how operating systems work kind of my whole life. Um, I then went off to college. I was studying economics and had taken some computer science courses as well. And I then met our uh, co-founders, Charlie and Paul, as a student at Columbia University in New York and had come back to just take on a software engineering internship for a summer with them. At the time, the product that we were building, a little bit different than the product that we have today. And so we were building something that was allowing shoppers to connect bank accounts and give them cash back rewards similar to what they may have on some high uh, you know uh, premier credit card uh, they'd get cash back rewards and really low processing rates for merchants and so i came in to help build that product out very early on this was an intern for a summer and said you know hey we've got really strong founders a really strong team that knows payments here and i'm uh, having done all these hobby projects and things throughout my life um, you know, one of the things you learn as you, uh, as you learn how to write computer software and, and build systems is that, you know, the, the tools that you use don't always, you know, you can learn them, but unless you have real world problems to apply them to, it's maybe not as exciting uh, and, and not a, a reason for you to start scaffolding and really building a strong system. And so uh, working with the team was able to help come in, build up some really, um, really exciting tech early on with that product and uh, grew through the ranks at Sezzle. So came in as an intern, then grew up into being the team lead, then into the VP of engineering role before taking on the CTO role. And so um, my uh, decision making on that process was as long as I'm still learning a lot and we're still building a lot of really exciting things, I'm going to continue to take time off of school to keep building into this team and into this product. And so that's where I'm at here now, you know, four and a half years later um, in the CTO role. And it's definitely evolved a lot over that time. You know, early days, um, you know, it's like our pre-launch days. Those days are, are really fun and fast. Um, you know, you, you don't have product market fit. You don't have a product you're supporting yet. So you, you have a little bit of time and space to make a lot of decisions. And you live by those decisions for a really long time. Um, you know, you're building architecture decisions. You're deciding how your team's gonna work on things. You're deciding, um, and making some assumptions about who your customers are and how this is going to work in market. Um, and then we have, you know, kind of the pre-market uh, uh, product market fit kind of phase uh, within Sezzle where we had a product out in market, we're supporting it, we're rapidly trying to iterate on product features to make it work. Um, and, and that's an exciting time too. It's time to actually have some live experimentation, really build out the personas of who our shoppers are, who our users are, uh, of our platform. 
And then, um, you know, it was actually because we have that product in market that we could start testing, which helped inform our decision on the pivot that we ultimately went through um, and to the, uh, the buy now, pay later space that we're currently in uh, and able to continue on with this very similar mission. Um, so pivot phase, really fun and exciting. We're able to go out, um, repurpose as much of the platform. Um, you know, one of the privileges sometimes as an engineer is being able to develop a system that is flexible enough to pivot without having to be fully rebuilt. Um, you can often build to, to over-engineer something and uh, if you over-engineer it, it can kind of handle any problem in the world. Uh, but if you are not over-engineering um, and, and building very specific, sometimes it's harder to pivot. So, uh, you know, we're able to pivot the product within about two months and relaunch our product. And since then, um, you know, our product we've got, got into market and now it's kind of scaling and iterating on that product to set other features that we have um, and really understanding uh, really who our customers are, how do we expand our mission within the product that has that product market fit and how do we scale an engineering team? How do we scale our, our system to make sure that um, we can handle large volumes of transactions and, and handle a lot of views and handle the load that the rest of our product has um, as, as we continue to have more and more consumers um, joining our product and visiting our app on a daily basis. That's awesome. It, uh, I, I want to get into the pivot. I want to ask questions around the pivot um, and, and how you handled that in just a little bit. But I mean, kind of going back to your development, I, I think it's in many ways, just an incredible story. I, I, di I didn't know that you're an intern. I mean, it's funny to think when you, when you say that story and you hear it from other people, you know, oftentimes that's over the span of what, 25 plus years. And it's incredible and, and in such a cool way to see, to see your development, you know, from intern to CTO of one of the fastest growing companies in Minnesota and obviously how successful it's been. I, I guess my question for you is just, you know, four years ago, you entered this team as an intern. Now you're, you're very successfully leading this team into growth into multiple countries and building a massive team. How, how have you found yourself developing and how have you, you kind of met the new challenges that you're starting to face as your role and as the companies evolve? Yeah, absolutely. You know, the, the role changes a lot. I mean, you can look at it as a percentage of how much time do you spend writing code as opposed to doing other things within the, the within the team and, and space, uh, at least in, in my uh, trajectory. And obviously you start I'm writing a lot of code, doing a lot of infrastructure, scaling out to being more of a recruiting and process and product roadmap um, is, is what things have developed into over time. And, you know, I, I think that the things that have really helped me in that process has been, you know, you, you have to be willing, obviously, to, to work really hard. You have to be open to taking feedback very openly. And you have to be ready to read a lot and know that you're not going to maybe know the best way to do something, but you have to go out, do your research, understand the best way that others are doing it, and then figure out the right way to apply that to the set of business problems that you have. And so I think one of the, the benefits, uh, me maybe not having multiple years of experience is I didn't maybe come in with a lot of the perspective of here's a way that something has to or needs to be done. I could try to take a pragmatic approach to say, okay, here's how some people are doing this, but here's what we're trying to do. And so here's some, here's some other version of that, um, that, that works for us or works for us right now, right? And, and can grow into a thing that, you know, maybe someone like an Uber is doing today. Um, and, and, and at the very least, you're picking some of those tools, you're picking some of those frameworks, and you're picking some of those processes that are going to grow with you, but aren't going to hold you back early on. So I think that, you know, luckily as a team, I think we made some good calls and we make some good bets early on. And it's been able to help our team and our product grow and iterate really quickly. I think that's really interesting what you said about um, kind of being open and honest about not knowing everything and being willing to dive in and do kind of self-research and kind of figure out how things are done, how other people are doing things and kind of applying that to your own framework. Um, and I think that's something that can be difficult for a lot of people to do kind of even when they're just getting started, even in that, that really early professional stage, you know, the intern stage, they, they might think like that they need to have this huge foundation of knowledge under them or that they need to know how to do most things before they really get started instead of just jumping in and, and learning as you go, continuing to learn as you go. Was that something that 
you had to develop as you started as this intern phase and, and through your professional career? Or was that kind of a, a trait that you had inherently before all this began? Yeah, I, I think it's a little bit of both. I mean, I, I think it's, you have to be open to always learning. And so you're always learning from your mistakes. You're always taking the perspective of, you know, um, hindsight's twenty twenty. But I think that having done a lot of hobby projects over the years, you know, a lot of times you just need to roll your sleeves up and start to build something and start to test something out and learn from your first impression on that thing to say, okay, I kind of get it now. I, I've been able to do something, uh, been able to build something with this new tool I'm trying out or with this new project. And now I want the time and space and opportunity to throw that away and try it again. And um, so I, I think that I, I had a lot of that coming in, but you got to make sure that when you know, we're building things, we're trying to build them in small chunks. We're trying to iterate in small chunks. And that gives us the ability to kind of continually release things, continually get product to market. And if we need to, we can back out a really small piece of it, kind of rethink it, retool it, and then get it back out. And so, you know, thinking in really small iterative chunks as a, as a team has really helped us as well, because the best way to, to get some of these things out is to launch something, you analyze some of the data and say, you know, hey, let's roll this back. We rolled it up to a, a small number of people, but uh, it's, it's not maybe showing the results we need to. Um, it's not scaling the way that we need to. Let's pull it back, let's retool it, and let's get it back out. So, um, you know, I, I think that it's, it's an iterative learning process. And I, I don't think that would change if I had 20 years of experience or the years of experience that I have. What were some of those hobby projects, just curious, that, that kind of helped develop your, your set of skills? Yeah, you know, I mean, I, I think I, kind of odd, but the first language I learned was C. I, I, I loved some of the lower level programming. And um, so I used to build just command line utilities to do different things in my computer. I used to build games and programs for calculators, um, learning basic and, and, and doing that through high school. And then into high school, I got more into the web development frameworks and, and learned things like Django and Ruby on Rails and started building websites and kind of my own blogs, my own websites. Um, you know, you, you do some of the fun stuff like trying to build uh, with, with other friends of mine, you know, we try to build like, what would a phishing thing look like? We do it to one another to see if we can catch one another. Um, you know, so just like really understanding how, how different systems work, um, understanding the things that are um, kind of fun to work with. And, and a lot of it really just comes down to scripts. And I think through a lot of that is where I, I developed a, a really strong uh, feeling for open source software as well, and have been contributing to open source software by the time I met Charlie and Paul, um, primarily in the kind of DevOps space, um, things that uh, are w mostly within the Docker ecosystem and different tooling to really help that ecosystem and make it easier from the perspective of a developer working in that ecosystem, how do I have tools that make this uh, easier? Uh, how do I develop faster? And, and taking the developer's perspective of how do I work on this on a day-to-day -day perspective were the types of open source tools that I was working on by the time I joined Sezzle. So kind of, kind of fast forwarding, um, products out there, team recognizes you need to make a pivot. Um, it, it, something that I'm kind of curious about, you just, you know, in a previous question, you talked about how quickly you guys made that pivot. Um, you know, the, the goal, obviously, when you pivot is that it's, it's that you have a product market fit and you take off like a rocket ship. And that's always the ambition. It doesn't always work out, but it, it literally was that end sum for y'all. So how did, how did you and the team build out a product so quickly and, and do it in a way that was scalable where you could very, very quickly grow upon it? Just, I'm curious to talk us through that process, how it works, and if you had to make considerations on time versus scalability, where did that pop up? Yeah, so I, I'd, I'd like to equate our product a little bit to the, the team and company that our CEO, Charlie, had built in the past. Uh, and and this, is, this is kind of how we got to the point of the pivot as well. So Charlie, before Sezzle, started a company called Passport Parking. So if you're driving around the streets of St. Paul, you're going to see signs for the, the parking spaces. And if you open up an app, that's the Passport Parking app. That's how you pay for, for pay, uh, parking payments in St. Paul. They also have uh, Park Chicago and Boston, a lot of cities across the US. And 
you know, in that business, every parking spot throughout the city, there's a sticker that is kind of their advertising. That's how they're acquiring shoppers and, and users in their, into their system. And so um, for us, our, our comparable product for that is our product detail page widget. So if you're out shopping, uh, you know, Sezzle's offering these interest-free installment payments to shoppers. You're on a, you know, say a backpack with $100 and our widget, one of the most critical parts of our product is uh, a widget underneath that $100 that says, or for interest-free installment payments with Sezzle. And we equate that very similarly to, you know, posting up stickers in the physical world, but we're doing this in a digital world and at the scale that you can in the digital world. And we had the, that widget really from the onset of the original product prior to our pivot, where we were, we were putting out there or, you know, 1% cash back and we could put that underneath that product price. And so with our earlier product, we had this in market, we can do a lot of testing on it. And we even saw that, you know, putting 10% cash back really wasn't even moving the needle in terms of, you know, does it lead to more clicks? Does it meet, lead to more conversions? And um, so we were able to test a couple of models just on this ahead of, Sorry, we cut that. Uh, I do have do not disturb on, but my uh, iPhone's a little bit uh, <laughs> um, nosy, but I think we're good now. Um, do you need a little bit of dead space? No, you can keep going. That's good. Um, okay, so you know we're we're putting up these product detail page widgets on our on these product pages that are showing this cash back, one percent cash back showing very similar results to 10% cash back. And so we're able to start testing and iterating on these widgets to find, you know, are there other ways that, that are near space pivots for us? We're, we're set up to be a payments company right now. We're, we're able to collect bank payments. We're able to pay our, our retailers that are already on our platform. And so, you know, using similar data that we had from TransUnion uh, that showed that there was this, this large drop in credit card usage between millennials and younger generations. We said, well, you know, kind of flipped the problem on its head and said, it's it's not a preference thing. It's not that people have credit cards and that they prefer to use uh, they prefer to use debit or they're preferring to use credit because they get cash back. It's an access problem, and and we want to find a way to offer a product to fill that that gap in the void. And so we were able to test with our widgets a model very similar to what we have now, and immediately we saw results come through on those product detail page widgets that we had with, with brands that we had partnered with on, on building this test out. And so from that point on, we knew, okay, we, we, knew, we do need to change. We've got some ideas on what that product needs to look like. And that, that really started that conversation. Um, a, lot of, a lot of us internally, like we said, hey, we think we can play this thing out. Uh, it's, it's a network business and, and we think we can get there. But as soon as we had some data to really drive the, you know, there is, there is interest in this and it's a near enough space pivot for us. Um, we knew that this was a direction we needed to, uh, to evaluate. And so, you know, I think it was with that amount of focus that the team was able to say, okay, we've been able to test. We, ha we have a really strong hypothesis for what this product needs to look like. And the different service providers, the different systems that we're going to need to swap out or need to build in order to really make that happen. And, you know, you, you definitely make decisions early on to say, okay, that's, that's, you know, in a couple of different categories of a must have, a nice to have, and uh, just not in scope. And so, you know, we, we focused heavily on the must have, what do we need at a bare minimum to get this thing relaunched? And you, you kind of pull some of those nice to haves back up in, in those. So we swapped a few service providers out that were really necessary, mostly for payment processing during that two month period of time. And then really started to build out this core loan servicing platform is really ultimately what, what it is um, for these installment, these uh, six week installment plans to, to start coming through on. So at the time we already had a strong CI CD pipeline. We already had, uh, so we had continuous integration and continuous delivery of our product. And so we were able to release code into our production environment already very, very quickly and very rapidly. And that was stuff that we had invested time in early on to say, okay, listen, we know we're going to be releasing rapidly. We know we're going to be releasing uh, iteratively. So let's make sure that that's an easy and stable process so that by the time we have 
uh, product and market, we can iterate on it really quickly. So we did make that decision early on to, to invest in that and, and take the extra time to make sure that that worked. And so that meant that we could, we could quickly follow on with those nice to have features and then continue to, to build on the mission from there. So in terms of, of building this big product from the ground up, uh, it's not a one person uh, task for sure. It takes a village, whether that's three people or 700 people or a thousand people. Um, now that you've moved from that really early, probably more, more code heavy uh, position to a little bit of a higher level position, um, I'm assuming you're making a lot of choices on who you're bringing into the team, uh, who you're kind of adding to, to those positions um, on the rungs below you as CTO. How do you go about adding people that you think are going to be uh, the right fit and motivated to help Cezil continue to grow? And, and what, what have you learned in your journey? You know, I think you have a unique perspective kind of coming in on the really ground floor of a company and kind of going up to the C-suite. So you kind of know everything about the company instead of coming in right at that top level. So you know kind of like what helped motivate you and, and what, what types of decisions helped you kind of hold that fire to make this product really successful. So how do you go about finding those people that are going to have those same type of uh, attributes? Yeah, you know, I, I think that high-performing high people always want to have challenging problems. People want hard problems to solve. And a lot of that comes from having some radical ownership for the things that you're doing and the things that you're, you have responsibility for. And so even though, you know, we're, we're growing, our team scaled a lot, we want to ensure that we still have a culture of a startup culture that every team that we're building, anyone that we're bringing into the team has strong ownership for the product that they're building or for the, the team that they're going to be on and that they can own some of those decisions end to end. And so that means that you've got to bring in people that are, are willing to continue to work in an environment that's fast paced and that may have vague requirements that, that they've got to pull from their various stakeholders. And so you, you know, you're looking for people that are, are ready to roll their sleeves up and build their own domain, build their own part of the company, build their own part of the product, really own that and help fill in that team, fill in that group alongside them. Um, and thankfully in fintech and in consumer finance and in retail, there are like, you pick all three of those, there are plenty of challenging problems to tackle. I think the other thing that's very important is we're bringing in people and bringing people that want to take on hard problems is that we're, we're not going to put our feet up. We're not going to sit back and maintain a product that, um, that is part of some problems we've already solved. We're going to keep taking on those challenging problems. We're going to find the next one. We're going to find the next thing to innovate with. And so continuing to have hard problems to solve and people that are coming in that want to solve those that are looking to, to work hard, they're looking to be really engaged with the product, they're looking to come into a mission driven company and, um, you know, are, are, are looking to have fun with it too. I mean, we're, we're not um, a very bureaucratic kind of corporate environment. It's, it's still fun. It's still meant to be fast paced. and. Um, so, you know, pulling all of our, our core values into, into the way that we're making hiring decisions, firing decisions, promotion decisions are, are really what are, have helped our team scale and grow. And, you know, I think you mentioned some of our, our growth numbers, uh, team doubling in size over the last year. Some of the risks sometimes when that happens is that the culture, uh, is, is completely different. Right. If, if uh, you're, you're diluting the original culture that was there that made the company what it was. And so it's important as we've been building the team, as we've been growing, uh, growing that out, that we're, we're still keeping the same core values. And we've been able to maintain the culture that's really working for us, that uh, makes it Cezzle a great place to work, that makes Cezzle uh, an innovator in the space. And we're, we're able to continue doing that with that type of growth. So it's definitely a challenge. Um, and it's, it's, it's one that, you know, similar to the technical challenges we take on, building a big team is one that has been an exciting one. And definitely for me, uh, uh, one of those kind of transition phases as I've come out of some of the technical things into, uh, all right, let's build a team, let's build processes 
And how do we enable a team to make their own decisions, to own their own product, to deliver their own product, to work with the different stakeholders or customers to really make sure that they, they own that and can own their own roadmap on that as well. Have there been some growing pains in, in doubling the company's employee base in, in the span of 365 days? Uh, you know, you, sp you spoke about um, that kind of dilution of the original company core values or, or not necessarily core values, but kind of the, the intangible vibe of the company that was there before it blew up. Um, has that process been smooth or have there been some kind of growing pains in that, in that growth? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that there's there's definitely a, a messy middle section in there. And part of that is is just like com company identity realization more, more than anything that, you know, we, there was definitely an inflection point where we had to look at what was making our culture the way that it was and what, what made our team and, and our company strong and, and not just kind of do that and live that, but document it and make sure that that was the way that we were making some of those decisions. And so I think that that kind of period where we had to, we had to take some time to define it um, because it's important that, um, that that's on the wall and it's not just the way that we all are, uh, particularly now that we're all remote and it's harder for some of those intangible culture things to maybe come out. Um, and you know, you're doing a lot more video calls for your, uh, for your communication. You're doing a lot more stuff on, on Slack or some message messaging platform. And so it, it's more important that, that those are on the wall and that we are, we're applying those to, uh, to every given role. Um, so yeah, I think there, there's a, a challenge in there for a while. Um, but sometimes that's just that uncomfortable, like introspection of like, what's making, what's making this work right now? What's working, what's not working. Um, and, and what do we want to look like? What do we want to feel like? It's the awkward puberty of a, of a company growth. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, that's awesome. Um, so kind of digging a little bit deeper, just specific to product on that. Um, I mean, it, uh, I loved hearing that you had kind of going in pre pivot, you had the foundation of deploying, testing, iterating really quickly, um, and updating your product. It, well, one thing that I'm always kind of curious about in these hyper growth phases, so you double your team in a year, how do you maintain those processes? So maintain people kind of operating in that ecosystem in those processes, while also recognizing that the people coming to the table have experience that are, that might help grow those processes. So continue to push the product forward while also improving the process to do it. How, how all does that happen? Yeah. You know, so, I think that a lot of that has come down to building strong pillars within the product and engineering teams. So like really core foundational to who our customers are or who the stakeholders are and really building strong teams that can remain small and relatively autonomous. And, you know, once, once those were set up and there were strong leaders in those groups and there were strong you know, real like technical architects in those groups that had strong domain knowledge and, and could deliver product really effectively, really reliably in those groups. It, it helps enable those groups to take on their own development processes, their own cycles and, and take on like, well, who are our customers? You know, we're building a mobile app. And so we need to be a bit more measured about when we're getting releases out because things take longer to update in that space, or we're building a web application and we can update hundreds of times a day if we really needed to and we can really quickly iterate and so different teams can take on different processes whether it be operational or product building processes given that they're small enough autonomous enough but also still connected to the larger product engineering team where they're not off and siloed and kind of uh, heads down working on their own thing it's still part of uh, one mission one set of goals and, and, and initiatives so. awesome now, looking down the road a little bit, one could say, looking at the map of a road or perhaps a road map, if one were to say that, what's something on the project product roadmap that you can talk about a little bit, even in broad terms, that, that's exciting for you? Um, obviously, you're, you're in this, this position of rapid growth, everything's booming, there must be some things cooking in the oven right now. So what's something that is cooking in the oven that you're, you're stoked about? Stoked about, look at me, I'm being so hip. 
Yeah, we, you know, I, I, it was a one interesting transition for us was going public and that, you know, there are so many things like we can talk so far in the future. Uh, you know, I think when you're early startup, I'd love to talk about way down the line. Um, but we do have a lot of really exciting things that have been in the roadmap for a while that we're starting to, to roll out and, and do some of those kind of iterative processes on. And so, you know, at Sezzle, we do a lot of, of our core business right now is in e-commerce and on online retail. And, you know, we've, it's a great, it's been a great time to do that as a lot of commerce has shifted to e-commerce, but it's also been an interesting time to innovate for brick and mortar and point of sale uh, in, in physical stores. And so we've got a product that we've been developing to take our product and, and build it out into the physical world in issuing virtual virtual cards that can be pushed into Google Wallet or Apple Wallet and tapped in the store and, and used via an NFC. And so we're excited to be getting those rolled out. And it's, uh, it takes a, a long time to work with the card brands and the issuers and the, uh, all the banks and different providers who need to make those happen. And then how does that map onto the customer experience that we're, we're used to? So we're really excited to get that out and start to take you know this product that's in the digital world out into the physical world and then we're also really excited about a product um it's called sezzle up as well and so it's an upgraded version of our product for shoppers in our platform and what it enables them to do is um, upgrade into this product they can see what their actual available limit is so today you're coming through our checkout product and you're you're not necessarily aware um, the limit that you're applying for uh, or, or what you would be approved for at Sezzle. And so within Sezzle Up as an upgrade, you can see that that limit in your product. And then also within our, our mission of financial power in the next generation, with that product, you also get uh, reporting to the credit bureaus and people are able to start building their credit for the repayment behavior that they're, they're making within Sezzle. So about 89% of our order volume through our platform is a repeat user, so someone that is making a purchase for uh, a subsequent time, not their first purchase. And so, it's we want people to be able to realize some of the the gains to their credit score on their credit journey within that product. So we're really excited to be rolling that one out. And I think you mentioned earlier also our Save the Holiday campaign. Uh, it's definitely a really fun one, very timely with the holiday season here, and uh, opportunity for for people to win, and uh, and also really to explore some of the the different uh, areas of our product that people may or may not be as familiar with right now. So a lot of exciting things coming through for the holidays. Very cool. Yeah, that's great. Uh, one of the other things too, is that you've been very, very public about uh, pushing globally um, in Canada, looking to India. Um, I'm just curious from a product perspective, what does that mean for you? You know, very highly regulated space. I'm sure it doesn't make things easier. So what, what, what sort of considerations uh, come with a decision like that? Yeah, it was definitely harder the first time we did it. Uh, I think you earlier, Nels asked about, you know, what are some of those things that you maybe don't envision scaling right away? Sometimes it's not like, what well, is this thing going to be in multiple languages? Is there going to be multiple currencies that we need to collect or settle in? So, you know, really combing through the product and figuring out all of those were challenges right away. And the way to think about, uh, we like to think about our product is that we've got this global merchant platform. So if you're a retailer, uh, you know, we can work with retailers in a lot of different countries, but they need to ship and fulfill orders into one of our localized shopper uh, current countries. Um, and, and that's really because a lot of the regulation is really around the consumer side of, of finance and the consumer side of payments. And so we've really got to customize the product on the consumer side of the platform a lot more for the US and Canada uh, as we look to the EU and the product that we have in India as well. And so it's, it was hard the first time and then you know you figure out, all right, how do we make sure that we scaffold this as a rebuilding so that we can plug languages in as we need to, we can plug currencies in as we need to. And then the challenge really becomes more of a, like what are some of those regulatory requirements that are coming into play and then does this product make as much sense in that market? Um, or does, are there tweaks and changes that need to happen? Um, there's you know, also kind of data center and data residency considerations from a, a really technical perspective, but um, a lot more of it comes down to um, 
you know, now we've got this platform, how do we, how do we rubber stamp that anywhere where there's a, there's going to be a similarly strong product market fit. Personally speaking, for you, so as someone who started as an intern and has, you know, risen to CTO, someone who's seen this company in its earliest earliest stages, and now it's kind of branching out globally across the entire planet, how does that feel to be part of that journey? You know, every single step of the way. Yeah, it's it's been really exciting. It's definitely a roller coaster. Um, you know, I I think if if you're up working on an incident at 3 a.m., you're like, you know what? Yeah, this is, <laughs> it's, it, it happens to be, you know, morning somewhere else in the world. And, you know, so, so there's a consideration on, you know, you've got to be kind of growing the team and the culture and expertise everywhere and not just here now in the U.S. But uh, it, it's really exciting to see the mission, what we're building, and, and see a product that can scale to more than just, you know, uh, the, the United States here and to have teams that are able to hop in and work in it uh, w without a, an incredible amount of guidance sometimes. Um, so we're looking at some of the, the ways that the teams are building the product. And so, you know, it's a sense of pride for the, the team really uh, and, and what the team has been able to build. I'm, I'm one person and I haven't been writing code on the platform for quite some time. Uh, thankfully, it's a, it's a thing that takes an immense amount of of focus to do properly. And so a lot of it really comes down to the, the team uh, really being thoughtful about how we're building it, which is exciting to see it scale and grow. And, and a team that, that is really passionate about the product and really passionate about what they've done and built, um, which you know I think has led to really low retention. It's, it's really exciting what we've got going. And um, it's, it's all of our goal just to keep that going. Do you uh, do you still get a scratch your code writing itch elsewhere? Have you picked up the the side projects, or do you do you even have time for that? Yeah, I mean there there are parts of uh, there there are some things that like help me within my role that are still code oriented, um, whether it be um, like taking inventory. I mean we're we're releasing code hundreds of times a month to our production environments. And so just taking inventory of where all those things are at and helping build tools for me or for other managers on the team to say, hey, are we missing things? Um, so uh, are we missing things? How does this tie into KPIs and different things that we're building as a team? And um, so, yeah, definitely not as much as maybe I, uh, I, I used to. Um, and, um, you know, I, I think that's okay, but I do think you have to stay fresh on some of it. and. I, I think it's important to to pick up a small thing here and there. So on, on the occasional weekend when I've got something open, it's it's something that, like I said, it's still a hobby of mine. So I'll pick something up here and there and, um, you know, pick it up, throw it away more than uh, pick it up and, and be ready to, to own and maintain something that I've got as a side project. Fantastic. All right, before we uh, kind of bring it to a close here, Killian, when you're not serving in the minutes of the day, that you're not thinking about being CTO of a incredibly fast growing FinTech company. What do you occupy your time with? What are, what are some of your hobbies? Like what, what do you do? Yeah, I, um, you know, you'll, you'll see me out running. Um, I, uh, in the winter, I'm a cross country skier. So you might see me out at, at Theodore Worth or out at Highland. So, um, you know, I uh, was a rowing athlete in college as well. So I've always loved the aerobic sports and so, that's uh, that's often what you'll see me doing, or you'll you'll see me with my nose in a book or uh, headphones on listening to a podcast. Fantastic, awesome! And if people are interested in learning more about Sezzle or following you personally uh, online, uh, how can they do so? Yeah, I'm uh, definitely most active on LinkedIn. If you're looking me up, uh, it's Killian Bracky on LinkedIn. And if you're looking to to see what we're doing at Sezzle, our website, we stay really up to date with that, or uh, anywhere on social media. Uh, at Sezzle or Twitter at Sezzle Inc. Fantastic. Awesome. Well, Killian, thank you so much uh, for joining us today on Tech.MN CTO Spotlight. Really appreciate it. And I'm sure we will see uh, lots of news from Sezzle in the, in the near future. So we're looking forward to that. Awesome. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, Alex.